welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hello, this is Jessica, and I am here with Stacy, <laughs> Brenda Janowitz, and Allison Richmond. And we are going to turn, turn the page. page. First of all, uh, I would like to welcome our guests. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome Thank back. You. And before we get started, I just wanted to give the audience um, a little overview or a bio, if you will, about both of our guests. Uh, Brenda Janowitz is the author of five novels, and she is also the books correspondent for Pop Sugar. Her sixth novel, The Grace Kelly Dress, will be published by HarperCollins Graydon House in March 2020. And Allison Richmond is the number one international best-selling author of seven novels, including The Velvet Hours, The Garden of Letters, and The Lost Wife. She's also a graduate of Wellesley College and a former Thomas J. Watson Fellow. Her novels have been published in 20 languages and have been bestsellers in several countries. And this I just found out. The Lost Wife is currently in development to be a major motion picture. And as I mentioned before, this is Brenda's second time on Turn the Page. And uh, Allison, um, also an author, is her friend. So uh, Brenda brought her in. Would you like to tell us a little bit about how your friendship started? Absolutely. So I met Allie through our mutual friend, Pam Jenoff, who's another fabulous writer who I think also has a book on my Pop Sugar Winter list this year. <laughs> uh, and so she connected Allie and I because we live near each other. And just that one initial meeting sort of blossomed into a real friendship, which is so lovely because in book world, you know, you know lots of people, but it's, it's a little rarer, I think, to make a, a true real friend. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I like to say Allie's my friend in real life as opposed to just on <laughs> Facebook. That's so nice. <laughs> yes, it's definitely a friendship that lifts off the page, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, Word play. Oh, <laughs> yeah, maybe this is a special off the page. <laughs> Turn the page. <laughs> I love it. So needless to say, I'm a huge fan of Allie's work. I think she's a brilliant writer, a really beautiful writer, um, in addition to being a good friend. But <laughs> we're here to talk about the writing part. So I was really thrilled when Allie told me about her latest book. And I feel like we talked about it a lot um, through its inception. And now here we are. Um, I guess this will broadcast after pub date. But we're, we're a few yeah. weeks before pub <laughs> okay. date. So it's, yeah, it's really exciting. Yes, I'm scheduling this for uh, the last day in February. The last, because this isn't leap year, right? So February 28th <laughs> is, the, right. is the last Thursday right. in February. And the and Secret of Clouds launch yes. is February 19th. So oh. it'll already be out, hopefully, into your Yay. library. Yeah, so let's dig in. So, Allie, tell us about this fabulous book you've written. Well, um, the Secret of Clouds is actually my first contemporary novel. Previously, I had published um, six historical novels, and and it came about truly because I was inspired by a local teacher in Syosset, who, a few months before the school uh, session started, started telling me about how every year she assigns to her third grade class to write a letter to their 18-year-old self. And she holds on to those letters until the day these children graduate from high school. And I was m immediately blown away that there was a teacher who was so dedicated that she would actually create a project that was 10 years long because her entire basement you know, has these filing <laughs> cabinets where she wow. stores these letters. And these letters um, are written in the students' You know, childlike hand, you know, handwriting to themselves, and she puts the postage on, t you know, these letters, and on the back of the envelope it says a um, a message from a, the past with a, a letter from the past with a message to the future, and I just thought that was, you know, so beautiful and really showed a teacher's dedication to her her uh, students. But on another level, it also made me think: what happens within ten years of a child's life? and what happens within 10 years of a, of a teacher's life. And 
And how does that lasting bond that is forged um, as early as the third grade, you know, in the third yeah. grade, um, does that last? Uh, what happens in the arc of both of their lives? And so that from that first sort of uh, seed of of awe of what is <laughs> you know of a t of a teacher's dedication, it started to take more universal themes of what ha you know what happens within a life of two people. And how do they transform each other's life? So the secret of clouds um, really came about on a sunny day on Long Island, <laughs> at the poolside, as a teacher prepared, you know, her syllabus for the year. Uh, and it's to me my my I always describe it as a love letter to that beautiful teacher-student relationship. I think almost everyone here can probably you know definitively say that they had a teacher who who changed their life or had an impact on their oh, life. Oh, yeah. absolutely. They play a big role. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that's true. I love hearing you talk about uh, the inspiration because I think it's so interesting how a novel sort of comes to life. And I think, uh, I'm sure you agree, a lot, of, a lot of times when we're speaking about our books, the question we're most asked is, how did you get this idea? Mm -hmm. And for me, ideas are sort of everywhere. And it's like, what doesn't inspire me? But um, the bigger question is, what actually makes a book? So can you talk a little about how you took this little germ of, a, of an idea and turned it into a novel? Right. So it's true. So I always say inspiration hits you in the most unlikely of places. <laughs> you know, my book, The Lost Wife, you know, part of the inspiration took place in a hair salon over here in the story. <laughs> Another time I got an idea at a cocktail party. But from that small seed, so much does germinate from that because you need, you know, a multi-layered story, one that sort of connects on, on many different levels. So from that small part, I started to also think about how I can weave in history into this book, even though I knew it would be a contemporary novel. Um, I didn't want to ignore that I come from a historical background um, mm -hmm. in, in writing. And so for my readers who have enjoyed me in the past, I wanted to make sure there was still some sort of thread that um, w was woven through the book where they felt that they were learning something that they didn't know. And so I look back into my own life and my children's life, and I remembered that there was a story that I had never quite, um, sh mm -hmm. you know, sh sh I don't know the word, shook and shaken from my, <laughs> um, from my um, memory, and that was that I had a, a babysitter for my son when he was first born who was an immigrant, immigrant from the Ukraine or Ukraine, I'm not supposed to say the Ukraine. <laughs> and um, she had been a nurse in Kiev right after Chernobyl happened. And um, she had told me about how for many years after that fact, children were born with very rare heart defects, sometimes childhood cancers, um, and that it was particularly painful because um, they had no idea when the nuclear accident occurred that there was radiation in their environment, that the government, the Soviet Union kept it uh, a secret for um, over three days. It wasn't until uh, Sweden saw on their um, satellites that there was, you know, some sort of new cloud going. Yes, you know. I, yeah. I remember reading about that. Okay. So um, I really had these very visceral memories of her discussing how it was so sunny on those days that they actually went out and they sunburned themselves they, or that the water in the in the river that 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 ran through Kiev was so warm that people went swimming in it and so I wanted to create a child that um, comes from is an immigrant who comes from Ukraine whose parents have fled after that has happened um, who is really searching for a connection because he has to be homeschooled and this teacher comes into his into his home and she learns about his family's history she learns about his particular vulnerability because he is born with a rare heart defect that prevents him from going to school and yet my teacher Maggie Topper mm -hmm. the main character she still assigns to him the same letter writing that she does to all her students and so his letter becomes a time capsule for what he's feeling at that moment in his in his childhood and um, I, 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 I wanted to do that because I feel like most people, I mean, you might have been aware of, of the Chernobyl. But it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, like I knew what Chernobyl was, but that particular aspect of it, you know, it hit the me not, not too long ago. You know, you get like every now and then you're down the rabbit hole, you can't sleep, and you're just like, oh, I'm going to read like a list mm -hmm. or something. And it's like, you know, the, 
the top 10 things you didn't know about and dying right, you know, Chernobyl. Right. And, yeah. and there have been and a lot of photographs, of like on BuzzFeed and things at Pripyat, yeah. the abandoned town where the reactor had been. That's, mm-hmm. And that's that's probably what led me right. down that rabbit hole oh, yeah. because I think like I have a fascination with abandoned places. Okay, so th- that has been sort of going viral and you see you know what happened. But because we were you know ha- had this sort of iron curtain for so long, especially during our childs, we didn't really know so much of the information. So I decided to take, again, something very small historically that my readers, you know, probably yeah. did not know about, and weave that into the ca- and into the background of one of one of my characters. So that became another layer to the book. Um, but then also, again, not wanting to ignore my audience, I've o- every book that I've written has always had some sort of art historical thread that ran through it, or some sort of um, way in which I weave in the creative process. Uh, I'm the daughter of an, an abstract artist and. Before I became a writer, I imagined that I would become a painter like my mother. But, you know, my mother said, I, I don't I think the paycheck will be better with a writer. The jury's still out on that. You just, <laughs> <laughs> you just paint with your words. It's no. a different type of painting. Yeah, so it's true. I really do try, like when I write each chapter, I do imagine it as a small composition. And that each sentence is this brushstroke that I try and, you know, move you through that story in a very visual way. So in the past, I've written about... You know, painters in The Lost Wife, a cellist in The Garden of Letters, an actor in in The Rhythm of Memory. In this book, I decided to have the main character's mother be a ballerina um, from the Soviet Union. And so uh, I was able to research what it was like, the training um, for a dancer uh, in Ukraine at that time and the competitiveness. You know, there's um, great little seeds of information about how they put, you know, crushed glass in each other's... um, toe shoes or a lighter under the leg to make the arabesque higher yeah (laughs) yeah yes i've I've heard a few i heard yeah i heard about the glass (laughs) the glass (laughs) but the the the, i interviewed a a ballet dancer on long island who had come from romania and she had told me how her teacher always held a a a cigarette lighter underneath her leg and said higher higher or you're gonna burn your you know (laughs) oh my gosh that's intense um you know, I, for my for my readers, hopefully, who have read me in the past, there's still those um, important things that I love to sort of you know have in my novels. But again, it is a contemporary novel that takes place on Long Island. That's exciting. I love that. So, tell us more about the research um, in terms of teachers and uh, mm-hmm. the teaching experience. I felt like when I read the book, um, it was such a vivid experience of a young teacher and not being a teacher yourself, how did you get that so right? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> because I got so much of it wrong in the beginning. <laughs> and I think I, I needed to have so many uh, teachers read my novel to make sure that I did get it right because I don't have the mentality of a teacher. For example, when my friend who had inspired this novel was reading the first draft, there was a scene in the book where um, a child hit another child with a the, the back oh. by accident and I had my teacher character you know to herself think that the child was faking the extent of her injury and she said no teacher would ever think that someone was faking it their immediate reaction would oh, be wow. compassion and I was like oh I guess this is the frustrated mother on my part that thinks that my son I, yeah no I I, I, I can I can jump right in right there I think I, I always joke around to Stacy like one of my sons is he's he's I mean I love him and he he does have authentic <laughs> but he's also very good at with uh, crocodile tears sometimes <laughs> right so I having had two children I always feel they're sort of inflating the extent of their injury so you know small little things like that or you know when my character actually does is able to go to school the sense that there would be preparing the classroom with you know antiseptic cleaner and would they be able to have that cleaner approved by the um, you know the school that it didn't have any chemicals all these things that I didn't normally think about but um, the mentality of a teacher especially a young teacher who is so earnest and wanting to do the right <laughs> thing it was pointed out to me that it's very different than a a, a teacher sometimes who has been teaching for 30 years and so I have two you know teachers in the book there's one that has you know a little bit more experience and perhaps sounds jaded although her heart is really in the right place and you learn her backstory but Maggie is you know a second year teacher very much wanting to prove herself wanting to forge a connection with her students right you know from the the get-go and learning about how passionate, you know, and selfless teachers are um, really, you know, made me want to infuse that spirit into the novel. Mm, I love that. So 
the contemporary setting will be something new for your readers, but there's also something really unexpected in this novel that knowing you as a person and as a writer, I did not expect to see in there. When I think of Allie Richman, I think of all things beautiful. So when I knew that there would be a ballerina, I thought, yes, that's perfect for my friend Allie. But there was quite a bit of baseball. (laughs) I know you have a son. I have two sons as well. So I guess we know a little about sports, but there's no way you knew that much about baseball. So let's talk about baseball in this novel. So you make me smile because in my, you know, um, they, my publisher did a Q&A to go with my press release with this book and one of the questions was what was the most difficult part of the research of The Secret of Clouds and I said this is going to surprise everyone but it was baseball so yes I think you know for those of us who are mothers um, when you imagine yourself with a child you think it's going to be an exact mini me of yourself even if it's a boy my great surprise in 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 my journey as a mother is that my son from the time he was five was an inc- you know incredible passionate baseball fan memorized statistics every player used to do baseball math where he would say the number of a jersey plus another you know number from another corresponding team and see if he could get the, you know the the apps you know the, the number at the end so <laughs> I and I was not prepared for travel baseball and the fact that <laughs> I used to joke when I would drive him home after taking him an hour early before practice, the game, which lasted sometimes three hours long, and then the ride home that I could have been in Paris in this amount of time. So, <laughs> um, See, that's the alley I know. Yeah. And my son, from his perfect perspective, would say, why do you, you know, take a picnic basket and, and, and a big hat and read until I'm up at, at bat and, and not look at my other <laughs> friends playing. And I would have to say, well, I don't really understand the game, Zachary, and I want to get the reading done. So <laughs> the alley that you are painting um, of not being drawn to baseball or wanting to put it in a book is 100% <laughs> accurate. But um, this is a book that takes place on Long Island um, dur- against the backdrop of the Subway series of the Mets and the Yankees playing. Yeah, Absolutely. And a little boy. And the little boy wasn't going to, you know, in this case, be drawn to the ballet world of his mother or, you know, another artistic world but as much as I wanted him to be. And that would be <laughs> much easier for so, me. And you know what? Sometimes, sometimes that does happen. That does happen, of course. But Absolutely. not, but in this but case. This, but, but your characters tell you who yeah, they are. Yes, yes. I, and in this case, because this boy, um, for the most part, is not able to go to school and, and to mm-hmm. interact with other children, baseball becomes a lifeline to him, you know, and to see that, you know, and to connect with his father. His father also wanting to, you know, to connect with American life and culture, baseball becomes that connection, mm-hmm. too. So researching baseball was really sort of fascinating because not only did I ask my son about why he loved baseball, I started to ask his pitching coach. I started to ask the men who, you know, were on the sidelines of the games, um, people who were – there's a, um, a local Long Island – young man named Sam Menzen, and he now, I think, works for the, um, the, sh- the Tigers. And he was really essential because he was a child during the Subway series, and he, he told me about how his entire room was, you know, plastered with, you know, different images of um, Andy Pettit, or, oh, you know, wow. <laughs> about, you know, all the people that he loved, um, you know, Mariano Rivera, why he loved them, um, and so getting his memories on that really sort of opened up how I was going to write Yuri. So I tried to do my due diligence. It doesn't come from a true passion of baseball by <laughs> any stretch of the imation, uh, imagination. But um, I, I, again, you, even if you have a contemporary novel that takes place in the 90s, you do want your book to have um, a, in historic accuracy and an emotional resonancy, I think, that comes from interviewing true life people who love, love that sport. Absolutely. I, I was checking with my husband as I was reading. I was sort of like, did this really? Okay. Well, and, and I kept trying to read ahead and say to him, okay, so what happened in the Subway series? And he was like, read the book. <laughs> so there was also more research you had to do because you mentioned how um, tr- this child was born at the time of Chernobyl and there were lots of different un- unintended... Um, Consequences. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so... Uh, is it giving away too much to talk about Yuri and his health and sort of um, wha- how this teacher comes into his life? No, I don't think so. I mean, certainly I, I think it's it's important to say that he has a, a sense of, you know, he's he's very fragile. 
And one of the things that I um, wanted to do and make sure that was accurate was to say, if a child is born with Epstein's anomaly, would he be able to go to school at this time? And so um, I, it's quite funny because I know you're, you're, you know, we, you know, <laughs> as our friendship blossomed, I learned that your husband was a pediatric, is a pe- pediatric cardiologist. And I had already spoken to his, when I mentioned right. the pediatric <laughs> cardiologist that had helped me with my research, <laughs> it ended up being one of his partners. Mm-hmm. So when I s- spoke to Dr. Lovecheck, you know, Lovecheck, what he had said to me is it was completely plausible and that, you know, um, it would have been a concern. He certainly could have gone to school, but he certainly, you know, if there had been reason for concern, it, it made sense. So um, I did create this almost cocoon-like shelter that he's living in with his, his family because they are new immigrants. They, they haven't completely assimilated into American life. Um, and it was, I don't want to say it was easy to put myself in in Yuri's mother's shoes, but we had, all, you know, had being a mother and worrying and what that, what that intensity of worry worrying would have been if you knew your son was born with a rare heart defect. Um, I, I wanted to make that very intense in the book. Yeah, I thought I thought it was incredible and very well done. Um, and right, as a mom, you know, we often say a child is like your heart, mm-hmm. just sort of walking around right. the earth. And there's something so beautiful yet terrifying about that. So of course, it would be intensified so much right. if there was... And there's something very beautiful and poignant when you do talk about a child's heart, either metaphorically or, you know, I mean, even when <laughs> we went out to dinner with your husband and he said, the, you know, the ch- a child's heart begins the size of a walnut, you know, or a closed fist, and uh-huh. as it grows, it mirrors that fist. It's a very visual image that um, I wanted to work with. Uh, also, the sense when, when you do hold your child for the first time and you hear their heartbeat against yours and, and knowing how essential that heartbeat is for life, um, that gave it this this sense of of, of poignancy that this child ha- you know is born with this this fragile heart so um i don't know if any of you have read the art of hearing heartbeats it's it's a beautiful novel by jan philip sendiker i haven't but okay. i know it's it's everyone like it's loves it it's beautiful and i had the privilege of of spending some time in in norway with him um this may for a book festival and he talked about how that that title came about because as he was holding his son against his chest, oh. you know, as a toddler, his father, he heard, the child heard his heartbeat and asked him about, you know, no, he didn't say the art of hearing <laughs> heartbeats, but, but what is that sound? Yeah. And he and he thought about this beauty, you know, and he that this rhythm that his son was hearing from his own chest beating. So it's something very beautiful as a writer, I think, to work with this sense of, of the human heart. I love that. So... Now is the part where I ask you, can you tell us what you're working on next? Sure. <laughs> Am I allowed? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm working on a novel now called The Rivers of Grace that um, actually also was inspired by a true Long Island story. <laughs> so it seems like there's a lot of inspiration, as you mentioned, all around us. We just have <laughs> we to open our that ears. Grown ins- inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's about a, a young Vietnamese refugee boy who comes um, over to uh, the United States in the 80s and how his life intersects with um, a, a woman who is an Irish immigrant on the south shore of, of Long Island. Um, so I took that small seed and I opened it up too because I wanted to create um, more layers. And so I also have a Vietnam veteran in the book and how th- all three of these lives intersect um, and help... Um, I don't want to say cause a sense, but help inspire a sense of healing between all three characters because they are suffering from certain hauntings in their past. That sounds amazing. (laughs) (laughs) First of all, I love it. So I know we've talked about this before. Um, So what you're really known for, your books in the past have been sort of, let's call it broadly, World War II novels. Mm -hmm. And with The Secret of Clouds, we're talking about Chernobyl. But now you're moving to a Vietnam vet, Mm -hmm. Vietnam War. Um... And that's something Kristen Hanna did. Mm -hmm. First she did The Nightingale, which is a World War II story. And then she did The Great Alone, which uh, had a Vietnam vet in it. And we talked a little, well, can you talk a little Mm -hmm. about World Mm -hmm. War II? And Vietnam. Yeah, and so interesting. So I, when I started, you know, researching this book, I didn't know that Kristen Hanna was writing a (laughs) Vietnam Oh, (laughs) I can't say it came about from that. And I, I think you were at my book review event with Jenna Blum when someone in the audience asked both of us um, did we ever think of doing something 
you know, with the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of blown away because I said, actually, that <laughs> is what I'm working on now. And I think it is a natural progression from World War II, um, which when I wrote The Lost Wife, which was my first World War II book, I started writing that book in 2004. Is that right? My daughter is born in 2006. No, so 2000, <laughs> 2008. 2008. came in 2011. So 10 years ago. And one of the things, and that was really before there, were, there, were, there was this explosion of Holocaust fiction. You had just had um, Sarah's Key yeah. but, and, and Jenna Blum's book, Those Who Save Us. But it, it wasn't the way it is now where there's yeah. a really like yeah. super saturation of World War II Holocaust novels. Very popular. Uh -huh. So, but one of the exciting things on doing research like that was that there were still many survivors who were in their 70s and 80s who really, um, as you know, they became older, were starting to feel that they would speak with people and share their sto some of their stories that they had never shared with anyone before. I mean, wow. many of them had done oral histories for the Holocaust Museum sponsored through Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation, but mm -hmm. still it wasn't something that was, you know, part of a, a constant dialogue. And so I felt very privileged mm -hmm. to be able to to weave in many personal stories that were shared with me through different survivors into The Lost Wife. And it really changed my life because it showed the power of um, of sharing story and, and creating universal themes that can connect us, whether we're, you know, uh, Jewish, white, black, you know, ch ch Asian, it doesn't yeah. matter that it, they're universal themes of love and connection of family and these things wanting to triumph over, uh, over great darkness and evil. So... Vietnam is, a, I think, a part of our history in which a lot of stories have not been told. These men came back f um, from fighting a war that they often did not believe in, but they were inscripted to fight, mm -hmm. um, often from very poor parts of America where they weren't educated and they were sent over at you know the age of 18, unprepared for what they were going to see and there, deal with that. Yeah. There does, if you don't mind me jumping in, there does seem to be, um, you know, because my, uh, my grandfather um, fought in World War II, mm -hmm. um, and there does seem to be just a very diff a different... Um, Reaction. Y yes, Well, yes. the World War II heroes came back to, you know, ticker tape parades, and the Vietnam mm -hmm. War veterans came back to uh, terrible things being said to them when they got off the plane. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. So I really wanted to sort of create a book in which their voice could be heard um, and their backstory and what they they endured when they came home. Um, and then the contrast with a young Vietnamese refugee boy who also doesn't speak English is fleeing, you know, you know, terrible circumstances to come to America. And how do those two people collide and how do they, you know, how do they heal? To me, that's really fascinating. But I'm in the process now. I mean, I have started the first 100 pages, but I spent the last six months mm -hmm. basically interviewing um, Vietnam veterans who were willing to share their story with me, and it's wow. been incredibly powerful. Wow. That sounds like it's going to be another really compelling read. I I'm, yeah. so. I'm excited you told us <laughs> about that. But back to The Secret of Clouds. Tell us about the postcards you brought. So Ooh. the publisher actually printed these beautiful postcards with the cover on them. I'm going to leave a few at, uh, you know, behind it with the Syosset Library. So if they oh. want to leave them at the circulation. Yeah. Circulation. Come to the Syosset Library. Yes. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and these cards. You can only get them here. <laughs> you can yes. only get them here. That's right. These cards are meant to, uh, they're postcards that you can send to a teacher that you remember in your life or that you feel oh. had an impact on your children's life. And just say thank you. Because one of the things that I wanted to do when I set out to write this book is to say thank you to all these amazing teachers who who really do help shape future lives and to instill a sense co of compassion, a love of books, <laughs> probably a love of the library, but um, powerful educators who are really doing good in a world where we need good. So let's end this with uh, each of us telling a personal <laughs> anecdote about a teacher who's really touched our lives. Because when I saw those postcards, the <laughs> first person I thought of oh. was Mrs. Rossler, my first grade teacher. Uh, she had such a massive impact on my life. She was this wonderful teacher, but she really believed in all of her students, and she really believed in me. And I think bolstering me with that confidence enabled me to do everything that I was able to do in my life. It sort of set me up. Um, you know, she would make you feel smart, and so that made you want to rise to the occasion and do your best. And it's something that has carried me throughout my life. And in fact, a lot of my first grade <laughs> classmates and I are now friends with her on Facebook. Oh. And it's the biggest treat because we get to tell her all the time how special she was and how much she meant to us. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm going to mention also um, my first grade teacher. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> who, Mrs. Goldberg, in St. James Elementary School, um, put a pe- piece of paper in front of all of us one day and a blob of tempera paint folded it and then said, write what you see. And I think I, that is really how I, I live every day. What do I see? It's not just what I see in my mind, but what do I see in my heart? And I think that's such a beautiful thing to think when we were six years old, she told us to look down at a piece of paper and say, write what you see. That's beautiful. No, you could go first, Jessica, because <laughs> I have to sort through the teachers. I know, in my I'm head. doing the same thing. I guess I'll jump to a different time in my life, just and, you know, I, I did um, cite him once in another um, podcast, but I'll do it again because I had a wonderful professor in college. Um, who was my film theory professor. And, you know, I mean, I did. I had wonderful, wonderful teachers in elementary school and in high school. And um, But I think um, he just had such a unique approach to everything. And, you know, I you, no matter if his class was at 9 a.m. or you always um, wanted to be there, his name was Harris Ross, and he passed away uh, recently. Oh, I know. So it was surreal in its own way. Of course. Yeah. He was just such a wonderful man whose warmth and humor radiated through everything he did. Um, and he made me a Hitchcock fan, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So definitely um, Harris Ross. I, I still can't think of one, so I'm just going to spout off the three in my head. My <laughs> third grade teacher, Mrs. McCaslin, and my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Minkoff. Uh, Mrs. McCaslin, because it was to think outside the box and do fun things that you could learn from. Mrs. Minkoff to be true to yourself. Um, I remember doing that because she, like one of the first things we did in class was an icebreaker of throwing a yarn ball and connecting with people. And you take, you say something about yourself that maybe they don't know. And these are, you know, kids you've been K through third already. And I was like, you want to know what? Like, all right, I like this. I love icebreakers. And then my college (laughs) professor, uh, Professor Pindell, he was, I had him twice for like English lit. He's a huge fan of like Faulkner and all that, which I'm not, but he came to me after (laughs) one of class. He's like, why don't you like talk more in class? Like you write like good papers, like talk more, like seriously, stop shortchanging yourself. Like I'll start like failing you. And I'm like, all right, sorry, sorry, Pindell. And like, it was just, you know, don't, ever like shortchange yourself be proud of who you are and what you can do so I like that yeah I think that was another thing with um with with Dr. Ross um because at the time I was really uh, leaning towards film theory and um you know he became my advisor and you know like there, there's always, you know, it's it's a tough field. And he's like, yeah, you know, somebody's got to do it. Why not you? <laughs> and even though, yeah, okay, so I didn't go into that field. It's still part of my background and my, you know, my passion. Like, if you if you get me talking about film theory, you will not get me to stop, so I'm stopping now. <laughs> but there really is that sense of, you know, like, you know, like, y- y- like yeah, but, you know, like, yeah, somebody's got to do it. Do it. You know, and I think what I'm hearing from everyone, just isn't the outsider at the podcast, is that, all three of you have mentioned that these people had belief in you. And so I think what's extraordinary about teachers is that, you know, for mo- the most part, all of us have parents that we, you know, hope believe in us. But when the f- who are the first outside mm-hmm. people who believe in you? And I think that's universally our yeah. teachers. Mm-hmm. And that's why we remember those who, who did make you feel that you could do anything, that possibility was infinite. And I think that's why we owe them a great thank you. I agree. Thank you. So we um, so thank you very much for um, for for coming here. Uh, this is Jessica and Stacy, and we are with Brenda Janowitz and Allison Richman, and we are going to close this chapter of Turn, Turn, Turn the Page. The page. <laughs> It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.